So welcome to our symposium. Uh, title, title is Decent Achievement and Future Prospective of Cognitive, Physical and Nutrition Interventions for Brain and Cognitive Functions in an Aging Population. And the main objective of this symposium is a future direction of intervention programs for promoting cognitive and brain health in aging populations. By the way, uh, I'm Kawashima from uh, Tokyo University and I will chair this session. And before we start, uh, I wish to express my deepest condolences to those who lost loved person by COVID-19. And now let's start. We have the uh, one, two, three, four, five distinguished speakers at this symposium. And the first presenter is the Bettina Husebo uh, from the Bergen University of Norway. And the title of her talk is Cosmos Improving the Quality of Life in Nursing Home Patients and Effectiveness Improve Implementation Cluster Randomized and Controlled Trial. So, Bettina, please. Dear Rui Takahashima, dear all of you, I'm delighted to be part of this digital 20th World Congress of Psychophysiology and to talk about the COSMOS trial to improve the quality of life uh, in nursing home patients. Nursing homes uh, are an, play an important role in the Norwegian healthcare system. Norway has about 700 nursing homes for almost 40,000 people. 80% of the nursing home patients have dementia and most develop behavioral disturbances during their disease. Multimorbidity and polypharmacy are common. About 10% of the employees do not have any education, but most are registered or licensed practical nurses. Permanently employed physicians, often general practitioners, are necessary because 56% of the Norwegian population is deceasing in a nursing home. I only want to mention the COVID-19 crisis to demonstrate the importance of our nursing homes. 37,000 people were infected in Norway and about 800 died. Most people were 60 years or older and 57% died in a nursing home. Most people living in a nursing home have multimorbidity. This means that some diseases are close related to other diseases and trigger their prevalence. For instance, hypertension, which is closely associated to heart failure, stroke, pain and depression. Interestingly, only 5% of people with dementia do not have multimorbidity. This fact is important uh, for the COSMOS trial because multimorbidity is the reason for polypharmacy. On average, each nursing home patient receives eight regular drugs and three drugs as needed. 39% receive antidepressants and 41% receive two or more CNS active drugs, including morphine. Another concern is the fact that about 40 to 60 percent of the nursing home patients suffer by undiagnosed and untreated pain. To improve the situation for our patients, we developed and tested the MOBI2 pain scale. This is an observer-initiated pain assessment instrument developed and tested in nursing homes for people with dementia. MOBIT is an acronym for mobilization, observation, pain behavior and pain intensity in dementia. Part one explores pain that might be related to the muscle skeletal system. Part two assesses pain that might be related to internal organs, head and skin. The instrument is easy to use in everyday practice, implemented in 300 Norwegian nursing homes and translated into six different languages. It is related to, it is tested, uh, related to reliability, validity, and responsiveness. This means that the instrument can be used in clinical intervention studies to assess the effect of interventions. 
Increased age increases the prevalence of dementia and pain. Dementia is often accompanied by stressful behavioral symptoms, such as restlessness and agitation. Etiology is multifactorial, but pain may be an important trigger for agitation. So, in one of our projects, we hypothesized that individual pain treatment reduces agitation in people with dementia. And this was a cluster, this was a cluster randomized control trial where we used paracetamol, morphine, buprenorphine, and pregabaline as pain intervention. We included people with behavioral disturbances in this 12-week trial. Compared to control, individual pain treatment reduced the agitation and during the first eight weeks. Um, when we um, removed the pain treatment to the medication at baseline, the agitation increased again, and this was a, a washed out effect. So, uh, pain and pain medication is not the whole story, because in Norwegian nursing homes, we already use a lot of pain treatment, which increased from 35% in 2000 to almost 60% in 2011. But people are still in pain. To improve the situation for our patients, our center has conducted several controlled trials but it is a very colored picture. And this is a reason for the COSMO study, because in the COSMO study, we combine pain assessment and pain treatment, advanced care planning, medication review, and organization of activities to improve the quality of life in our nursing home patients. This is a multi-center cluster randomized control trial over nine months. And we included more than 700 patients from 33 nursing homes with 67, 67 units clusters in eight municipalities of Norway. The implementation of the trial was a huge topic with the inclusion of nursing home staff, nursing home managers and regulatory updates. And this is my team at the University of Bergen, at the Center of Elderly and Nursing Home Medicine. And this picture does also include three medical students from Tohoku University who were on research stay at our center, Erika, Erika Ito, Taizo Yamaguchi, and Shunta Wagatsuma. People with dementia were uh, 65 years old and included in this cluster randomized control trial with an intervention for four months and for follow up in months nine and this compared to control. Trained staff uh, were used in the intervention group. The primary and secondary outcome were changes in quality of life measurements, the Qualidem, Quali and EQ-BUS. We uh, assessed the activities of daily living, living, the medication, staff load, and clinical global impression of change. The mean age of our included pe people was almost 87 years. Three of four participants were female. Almost 80% had dementia. On average, they had five diagnoses. They received eight regular drugs and three on demand, and uh, more than 40% had behavioral disturbances and pain. The COSMOS intervention had several positive effects, better quality of life, less medication, less depression, less agitation, and better appetite uh, activities of daily function, and re reduced staff burden. However, in the early phase of the intervention, the quality of life decreased in the intervention group, whereas the quality of life improved in the control group in all the three measurements. First, we were shocked by these unexpected results because the feedback 
by staff and relatives were quite positive. But we had to realize two facts. First, intervention studies include a lot of additional workload for the staff in an already pressed situation. The second reason may be the Dunning-Kruger effect, stating that people with low ability at a task, those in the control group, overestimate their own ability. And those in the intervention group realize the realistic and bad state of their patients because those in the intervention group received education and are able to understand more. In another article, together with our friends from Tohoku University by Erika Ito, we investigated the negative impact of psychotropic drug use on quality of life in nursing home patients at different stages of dementia. Here we found that more than 70% are treated with at least one psychotropic drug and that the quality of life decreases by increasing numbers of psychotropics, probably with the exception for antidepressants. There are some more interesting results about quality of life. In this article, we describe the relationship to pain treatment and found people with dementia using pain medication have a lower quality of life compared to those with need for pain medication, but not using analgesics. Results stress the need for regular, regular medication review and non-pharmacological pain management. We also investigated how, where and why it hurts. And we found in the COSMOS study that 44% have clinically significant pain. Most people have several pain locations, especially in the mus muscle skeletal system. 34% have pain despite analgesics. 10% have pain without analgesics. And 27% have no pain but receive analgesics. So, to conclude and some more results. Quality of life is temporarily declining in the intervention group of the COSMOS study, probably due to labor-intensive intervention, and we have to suggest the Dunning-Kruger effect. The activities of daily living function increase and we use fewer medication in the intervention group. Employees are less stressed and rated COSMOS as clinically relevant. Um, advance their planning, and I did not talk about this here now, but we found that advanced care planning can be implemented and fewer people were admitted to the hospital. Non-pharmacological multi-component interventions like the COSMOS require large samples, follow-up and monitoring of the implementation efficacy and impact. So, I am working at the Center for Elderly and Nursing Home Medicine at the University of Bergen, and I am the Head of Innovation at the Department of Global Public Health and Primary Care. We are working with research, training, implementation, and national and international collaboration. Thank you so much, and do not hesitate to contact me by this um, email address. Thank you, Bettina. Wonderful talk. And I <laughs> would ask you one thing, okay? So yes. what is the most significant take-home message from your presentation? What is the most significant take-home message? Uh, my most uh, significant uh, message is that we, um, that um, nursing home patients or nursing home medicine is complex, Mm -hmm. that we need 
complex interventions and that we should increase the focus on non-pharmacological treatment. Yeah, thank you very much, Bettina. Thank you. Thank you. Then thank I you. will move on to the next presentation and I will introduce Chan Yi Yu, Professor Chan Yi Yu from the Healthy Aging Research Center and Department of Occupational Therapy, Changyun University at Taiwan. And the title of her talk is Effect of Combined Physical with Cognitive Training on Cognition, Physical and Daily Function in Older Adults with Cognitive Decline. So, Wu Sensei, please yes. start. Thank you for uh, your introduction. And um, today I'm going to uh, present uh, one of my research effects of combined uh, physical with cognitive uh, trainings on cognition, physical, and daily function in older adults with cognitive decline. Uh, the cognitive decline occurs in aging population. As we know, cognitive function is highly related to daily function. Once the old people decline in cognitive capacity, then their daily function will be impaired, uh, especially if the cognitive decline is, uh, goes beyond the uh, normal decline, such as mild cognitive impairment and even dementia. Then uh, the uh, older people will have uh, encounter uh, will have encountered a great uh, difficulty in uh, dealing with their daily activities and increase the burden of uh, caregivers and even uh, the society. So how to prevent cognitive decline or how to maintain cognitive ability become an important issue for the uh, aging population. Cognitive training is defined as guided practice of a set of structural tasks designed to train individuals on relatively well-defined cognitive processes and abilities. Previous studies and numerous studies show positive effects of cognitive training on overall cognition and the different aspects of cognitive abilities, such as attention, immediate and delayed memory, working memory, uh, executive functions, uh, verbal fluency, and naming. And the effects might range from small to moderate. The possible uh, mechanisms underlying cognitive training refers to promote neural and cognitive plasticity. The cognitive training may increase functional connectivity and cerebral blood flow in resting state brain and induce predestined biochemical changes in hippocampus or increase other uh, energy consuming neural components. Since through this uh, promotion of plasticity, then uh, the participants uh, may increase their uh, cognitive function and decrease dementia incidence. In recent years, the phys physical exercise has been called for to uh, improve cognition. Physical exercise is defined as applying the structured and repetitive movement to improve or maintain one or more components of physical fitness. And several studies show that the physical exercise not have positive effects on physical fitness, dimension, quality of life, but also cognition. So we are quite interested in how the physical exercise improve cognition. So some other studies show that the uh, benefits of physical exercise on cognition, including attention, memory, executive function, and lowering risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. The mechanism for physical exercise to de uh, decrease uh, cognitive impairment is that it may um, uh, may increase uh, may anti uh, chronic inflammation or increase growth factor induction and signaling cascades. Uh, therefore, uh, it may uh, protect the brain health. So the cognition, plasticity, neurogenesis, and vascular, vascular function are increased. Although uh, exercise and cognitive training improve cognition, but the effects are quite limited. So um, some researchers try to combine these two interventions, that is combine cognitive training with physical exercise. Uh, 
In a combined intervention, the physical exercise may have facilitation effects, and the cognitive exercise may have guidance effects. For physical exercise, uh, may, uh, it may uh, trigger neurophysiological mechanisms uh, like increasing neuroplasticity, releasing uh, BDNF, uh, synapogenesis, and neurogenesis. For the cognitive exercise, it may initiate the survival mechanism of newborn cells. They may train the participant to successfully ex execute cognitive tasks activate or simu stimulate the newly generated synapse of neurons and facilitate the functional integration of new neural structures in the respective brain circuit and stabilize the induced neuroplastic uh, changes. There are two modes of combined intervention. One is sequential mode, the other is uh, simultaneous mode. For the sequential mode, uh, the physical exercise was performed first, followed by cognitive exercise. For the simultaneous mode, uh, the participant performed one task with two purpose uh, concurrently. One uh, purpose is doing uh, physical exercise. The other uh, purpose is uh, responding to cognitive task. For example, you may ask the participant uh, walk quite walk uh, quickly while they have to respond to a calculation task. Uh, the meta-analysis show that the combined intervention has uh, some uh, uh, effects. In the uh, meta-analysis by Carson Moritier in 2017, uh, this meta-analysis uh, uh, concluded uh, included seven studies testing sequential mode effects. Three studies testing simultaneous effects. However, these studies uh, widely vary uh, the intervention components. For example, for physical component, they may use Tai Chi resistance, resistance training or physical therapy or balance training. For the cognitive components, there are a variety of uh, training like may uh, focus on memory training or focus on attention or focus on some of these uh, components. And these studies uh, last about two to 12 months uh, with two to six sessions per week and 30 to 120 minutes per session. And the results of MENA analysis show small to moderate effects on global uh, cognitive function and also moderate to large effects on ADL. So the combined intervention also show uh, uh, quite a uh, positive effect for improving uh, our uh, the participants' uh, cognition and uh, daily function. In the previous studies, it showed that the sequential mode is better than single mode, and the simultaneous mode is also better than single mode. But uh, different dosage between the sequential mode and single mode groups were found in the previous study. Also, the single mode did not involve active intervention. Last, uh, the previous studies did not uh, directly compare uh, these two types of combined training, that is uh, sequential versus simultaneous mode in one study. So we want to know that which combination intervention is more beneficial for older adults with cognitive decline and do the, uh, the direct comparison. So the study purpose is to examine whether combined intervention of cognitive and physical trainings can lead to enhance the cognitive, physical, and daily functions in older adults with cognitive decline. Second, we want to examine which combined intervention is more beneficial for older adults with cognitive decline. This is a cluster randomized control trial. The cluster is based on nursing home or daycare center. And the interventions include four groups. One is cognitive training. The other is physical exercise. These two groups serve as active control groups. The other two groups are sequential training group and dual training group. And uh, for the four groups, uh, there are 20 uh, subjects for each group. And we uh, perform 36 sessions with two to three sessions per week and the 90, 90 minutes for per session. And uh, for the cognitive training, we 
use BrainHQ computerized program to train the cognitive components uh, in uh, different components, including like attention, uh, memory, executive function, calculation, and visual spatial abilities. For the physical exercise, we uh, include uh, several components, including aerobic exercise, resistance exercise, balance. And we also do the uh, warm up with stretching. For the sequential group, we perform a 45 minutes of physical exercise first, and then followed by a 45 minutes cognitive training. For the dual task trainings, uh, we have we break into two parts. Uh, for each part, it's, uh, it's uh, 45 minutes with uh, physical exercise plus cognitive training. All participants are aged greater than 55 years and they have self or informal reported cognitive complaints. And the MOCA and the MMSC score uh, has to be greater than 18 and MOCA score less than 26. And the outcome measures include three aspects. For the cognitive function measures, we use Western memory scale and picking up three subtests of spatial span, work list, and facial recognition. For the physical function measures, we use the chair stand test. For the daily function measures, we use Lawton instrumental activities of daily living. And we use the mix uh, ANOVAS to uh, examine our uh, study questions. Regarding the results and discussion, let's see the within group comparison first. Uh, as you can see, the cognitive group show better uh, facial recognition and uh, physical function and daily function uh, after training than before training. So the possible reason is that the cognitive training just focuses on the cognitive component. So it increases the visual recognition, especially we use uh, the um, brain HQ computerized uh, programs. In this program, there are many uh, tests with uh, visual input and visual response. So it may increase visual recognition. And we also incorporated the multi-domain cognitive training, which exerts effects on varied uh, cognitive abilities. And this is an interesting finding that cognitive training can increase physical function. However, this finding is consistent with the previous study. And we, it's interesting to further study uh, why the cognitive training improve the physical function. Uh, last, the cognitive training uh, may play a role of mediator. It can increase the IDL in terms of uh, increasing the cognitive function and let the uh, participant has more ability to perform or to plan or to uh, revise their uh, their uh, daily functions. And this finding is also consistent with the previous study. Uh, in addition, for the sequential group, we can, as you can see, that the word list performance is better after training than before. For the dual task, the spatial training, spatial span uh, performance is better, uh, uh, is better after training than before. So physical exercise trigger the neurophysiological mechanism to increase neuroplasticity, release of BDNF, and cognitive training functionally integrates brain circuit and stabilize the induced neuroplastic changes. So if we take these both together, they might induce synapogenesis and neurogenesis, uh, consequently might uh, lead to the increase of cognitive abilities. We further look at the uh, results of uh, our, our primary uh, study purpose. We do the uh, between group comparisons and the results show that the combined mode are better than single mode. For the combined mode, uh, there are different uh, effects on different aspects of cognitive ability. For the dual task, for the dual group, the spatial span is better than the sequential group. On the other hand, the sequential group, the word list performance is better than the dual group. So for the dual task, because uh, they uh, involve the uh, exercise with uh, cognitive training, so it might uh, increase the prefrontal activation, and this area might also be related to visual working memory. So these findings are consistent with the previous study. 
in addition, in this study, uh, we have a high degree of visual spatial processing to achieve the physical demands with body position and of working memory process to respond to cognitive tasks. So it might be the reason that the dual, uh, dual group has a better performance in spatial span. Uh, for the sequential group, since the sequential group may uh, focus on the cognitive training under a beta preparation using the exercise. So it might increase their cognitive ability, the specifically in the verbal short-term memory. This finding extended the previous study finding in that the present study used the dose-matched group design. Uh, so uh, the results are more uh, valid. In conclusion, uh, the combined modes are better than single mode to increase uh, cognitive abilities in older adults uh, with uh, the cognitive declines. However, uh, we may have a different uh, combined mode to uh, engender differential effects on the specific uh, cognitive abilities. For the dual group, uh, it might be used to increase the visual spatial working memory. For the sequential group or the sequential uh, modes, it might, better, might be better to facilitate verbal uh, short-term memories. And for the cognitive training, which, is, which has been used for a long time, and it's also useful. It can be uh, used to increase the physical function and increase IADL, uh, a mediating effect of global cognitive function. For the future study, we might further study the mechanism of improvement in physical function after cognitive training. And we may use uh, more sensitive measures to detect the possible change after different type of trainings. Also for the training program, um, we think we need to um, increase the uh, context enriched uh, cognitive training. And we need to embed more functional components into the cognitive training so that the particip participants can uh, uh, have the gain on cognitive ability and transfer this ability into their uh, daily life. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Wu Sensei, wonderful presentation. And also I want to ask you, what is the significant uh, take home message from your presentation? Yes. I think uh, we can choose different type, uh, different type of uh, cognitive training depending on your treatment goal. So as I show, if you want to uh, train the spatial span, then maybe your task is uh, better. So if you want to uh, increase the physical function IADL, then our uh, traditional cognitive function, cognitive training might be a good option. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Then the next presentation is Professor Louis Nauti at from Top University. And his talk, title of his talk is Brain Training Game Improved Cognitive Health. So Louis, it's your time. Today I'd like to share our recent achievement using the brain training game. As we know, the population of older adults is increasing in the world. As you can see, now is uh, 2021, and then the almost developed country, the over 15% of the older adult is, 50% uh, of adult is older adult, I mean the fifth, and also the aging has negative impact on cognitive function and the brain structure. Please look at left figure. Unfortunately, our cognitive function such as working memory and long-term memory and also the processing speed rapidly decline after a 20. And also our brain 
especially brain volume is shrinking with age. Previous studies have already shown that daily intervention can prevent cognitive decline and dementia. For example, cognitive training and physical activity like exercise and a healthy diet or nutrition intervention can uh, delay the onset of the dementia. Age-related cognitive decline has negative impact on the daily life. For example, older adult who has lower cognitive function, they show the lower daily activity. They can do the self-care and the household caring or shopping or traveling. And also people with lower cognitive function show that lower quality of life and the depressive symptom. So the purpose of this presentation, we investigated whether the cognitive training game can improve cognitive function, mood, and daily behavior. First study is focusing on the improvement of cognitive function. We developed the cognitive training game named Brain Age with Nintendo Company, and then the brain training game have been popular in the world. Our training materials include two types of training materials. First one is reading aloud the sentence. Second one is simple calculation. Because this simple cognitive activity lead to greater brain activity in the wide range of the area in the human brain. So in this study, we investigate the beneficial effect of brain training game on the cognition. We recruit healthy older adult, and then we asked the participant to play this brain training game or puzzle game for four weeks. After four weeks, we found signif significant improvement of executive function and processing speed compared to the active control games like Tetris. And also we found a significant increasement of regional gray matter volume in the frontal area. Second, we investigate beneficial effect of the cognitive training game on the depressive mood. Our previous study using healthy young adult, we successfully showed that standard cognitive training, such as working memory training, can reduce the depressive mood and fatigue and also the reduction of the insular activity during the emotional task. So based on the finding, we hypothesize cognitive training game can reduce the negative emotion even if the older adult. We developed the simple processing speed training game 
In this game, we ask the participant to play the simple speed training task for four weeks. For example, participants have to line the, the number from 1 to 5 or 1 to 20. And also, that we ask the participant to push the, uh, the number related to the figure. These are the simple training uh, task. We recruit seven, uh, 72 healthy old adults. Before and after four weeks training period, we measured cognitive function and also the emotional state. Here is the result. We found significant increasement of cognitive function compared to the active control group. Red bar shows that the, the uh, change score, improvement score of the uh, processing speed training group. Blue bar shows that active control group. And the significant result, main significant result is here. Only a processing speed training group shows that the reduction of the depressive mood. So we found cognitive training game can reduce the depressive mood. Finally, we investigate the cognitive training game can enhance car driving performance in the healthy old adult. Decline of cognitive function and brain volume would make daily behavior difficult. For example, previous study have already shown that older adult who has lower executive function shows that risky car driving performance here. So that's why the researcher want to find the way to improve the car driving skill. Here we developed the car uh, quantitative training game for car driving skill. We developed three types of the uh, training game. This training task training game are highly correlated with the car driving performance, such as processing speed, dual attention training, and prediction of the speed. We asked the participant to play this uh, card cognitive training game for six weeks. And then we measure the car driving skill in the uh, car license school, like here. And then we found cognitive training group shows that uh, significant improvement of the car driving skill in the turn and the start and stop, uh, go through the junction and the change the course. So in some three our training uh, study showed that cognitive training game can enhance cognitive function, mood, and daily behavior. So I believe that cognitive, cognitive training game makes us smart in the future. That's it. Thank you, Rui. So, so what is the significant take-home message from your presentation? Yes. Yeah. So one sentence. One sentence. Uh, try to new thing like the cognitive training can make us uh, better. 
mm -hmm. try to challenging, it should be important. Okay, it's a great message. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you again. The next presentation is by the uh, Lori Butler at Angelia Ruskin University, UK, UK, and his title of his talk is exploring the impact of flavonoid interventions on brain and cognitive function. So, Lori, please start. So, what I want to do is present some uh, some some data from uh, work that I've been doing with with colleagues primarily at the University of Reading, uh, but more recently with colleagues from Tohoku University and also Anglia Ruskin University, where I am now uh, based. So most of you will be familiar with graphs like this. They show um, the increase in life expectancy over the course of the last 100 years or so. Obviously, this is a good news story, but also comes with various costs. So there's an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and also an increased likelihood of age-associated cognitive decline. Um, two key aspects of the data as well is in terms of uh, years of good health. So obviously, one of the things that we want to try and do is ensure uh, that people live healthily for as long as possible. And what the data doesn't show is the impact of COVID-19. So if you were to extend those graphs by another year, what you'd find is that life expectancy on average dropped back to around 2010 levels. So as you'll know, many uh, factors determine the chance of cognitive decline. So aside from age, uh, there's a whole range of sociodemographic variables that are really important, genetic factors such as APOE, E4, and also other lifestyle factors such as physical fitness levels and levels of mental stimulation, which of course we'll be considering as part of this um, symposium today and the effects of nutrition, which is the question that's particularly interested myself and uh, colleagues, not just at Reading, but also, of course, research groups around the world. So although food traditionally has been thought of as providing energy and the building blocks for growth, uh, there's been an increased focus in the last 20 years on the influence of dietary factors on the systems and mechanisms that maintain cognitive function. So we've been particularly interested in a group of polyphenols that are naturally occurring substances found in plants that are called flavonoids. So there are around 6,000 flavonoids that are, are, are known, of which they are grouped into six subclasses. I'm showing you five of the subclasses here, and I'll talk a little bit later on about some of the evidence that uh, we've been uh, collecting for, for various uh, subclasses of flavonoids. Um, what's interesting about flavonoids is they have anti-inflammatory, and also antioxidative properties, which make them really plausible as potential mechanisms for influencing cognition. So in terms of those plausible mechanisms, so one of the things we know is that flavonoid classes are known to cross the blood-brain barrier. That's really important if you're going to uh, uh, look for evidence of flavonoids on cognitive uh, performance, one would expect to show some evidence that they can at least uh, influence directly or indirectly the brain. Flavonoids also have vasodilation properties, both in the periphery uh, of the body, but also in the cerebral cortex. And I'll show you some evidence of that later on. That may work through nitric oxide synthesis. There are also a range of other uh, uh, interesting mechanisms that I won't go into today, but one I will mention is their involvement in BDNF synthesis and expression. So BDNF is a neurotrophic factor involved in the maintenance uh, of, 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 of neuronal synapses, but also in their functioning as well. And it's something I'll return to later on. So the key question we and other groups have been asking is, can flavonoids modulate cognitive function? So the first study I'm just going to present quickly is, is not a study from our lab, but it's kind of a study that illustrates why we should be interested in this question. So uh, Letourne et al. Uh, measured performance in a large group of older adults that were healthy at the time they started the study. They, meant they measured cognitive performance over the course of 10 years in four, uh, four time points. They also took detailed dietary information, which allowed them to segment that group of older adults into four groups. So the, the, the continuous line represents a group of adults that had the highest flavonoid content in their diet. And then the dotted line represents the group that had the least flavonoids in their diet. And what you can see in these fitted curves quite clearly over a 10 year period 
is a, a cognitive decline across all four groups, but a significantly steeper decline in the lowest flavonoid intake group. So this is an association between flavonoid intake and cognitive uh, and cognitive outcomes. So this really sort of piqued our interest in whether you could show a, a more direct relationship between flavonoid intake and cognitive performance. So the first study we did at Reading was a study looking at uh, a 12 week flavonoid uh, supplementation on a spatial working memory task in older rats, so an animal study. And let me just take you very quickly through the main results. So there were three groups of rats. There was a, a group of young rats, okay, which are represented by the squares on that left hand side graph. And basically over the course of 12 weeks, they performed uh, really well on a spatial memory task. The key thing about this group was they weren't supplemented with blueberries or any other type of flavonoid, they just had a normal diet. There was a group then of older rats, uh, 18 month old rats represented by the circles at the bottom of that graph. They also just had a normal diet, no flavonoids in their diet, and they performed really poorly across the 12 weeks of the study. The final group was a group of older rats that were the same age as the, the circle rats, and they're represented by the triangles. So they had a diet which was enriched by 2% blueberries that were mashed into their, uh, into their diets. And as you can see, by three weeks into the trial, they were performing at a level that was um, statistically in, 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 uh, uh, indistinguishable from the group of young rats. And they performed at that level all the way across the remaining study. Now, on the right hand side, what you can see is uh, uh, some measures of BDNF that were measured in the hippocampuses of the brains of those rats. So the key thing here to note is that the young rats and the blueberry enriched rats on the right hand side had similar levels of BDNF present in the hippocampuses compared to much higher levels, uh, much lower levels, sorry, in the older rats that weren't blueberry supplemented. So this suggests a plausible mechanism of action for uh, uh, these rats and showing impacts of uh, blueberries on cognitive performance. So of course the key question is, well, okay, so what happens in humans? So this is just a, a section, a subsection of studies that we've done with people. So the first one is a study of uh, flavonoids in citrus fruits, so flavonones. And what this first study shows is a commercially available flavon, uh, a commercially available orange drink uh, matched against a placebo match for calories and sugars. And this effectively was commercially available with the inclusion of orange pulp. And orange pulp is really important in terms of binding in flavonoids into, uh, into orange juice. So I won't go through the detail of the study now, but effectively what we did was we had uh, a crossover design uh, and this was an acute study. So this is a single dose of flavonoid rich drink versus a control drink. Uh, we measured performance at baseline, then at two hours and six hours, and all participants completed both arms of the study. So this is the key uh, sort of set of findings from that particular study. And, and what's interesting is what happens at six hours post drink. So as you can see in the placebo condition, participants um, show a fatigue effect. So they get poorer at six hours compared to the start of the study. Whereas in the blueberry, uh, sorry, in the flavonoid enriched group, which was the orange flavonoid enriched group, uh, they maintain cognitive function at six hours. And this is also backed up by the subjective alertness data, which shows uh, a reduced attenuation of alertness at six hours in the high flavonoid condition. Now, we also looked at the uh, acute effects of uh, flavanols contained in cocoa. And this used some sachets that we, uh, uh, we were able to use from, from Mars, who provided some really, really well controlled drinks that were I, completely matched in all uh, characteristics apart from their flavonoid content. So we had a fl high flavonoid content drink and a low flavonoid content uh, cocoa drink. And what this data shows is some arterial spin labeling data. So this shows changes in cerebral blood flow into the brain as a function of that high flavonoid drink versus the low flavonoid drink at two hours. And what you can see is activations here in the anterior cingulate gyrus and also in a, in a region of left parietal lobe. And these regions, particularly the anterior cingulate gyrus, are really important for task monitoring. And we know that that's a region that's also been implicated in the whole range of cognitive and emotional processing tasks. So in this study, 
we have a plausible mechanism of action which suggests that flavonoids uh, increase cerebral blood flow through, uh, uh, through, through vasodilation. But of course, we also want to know what happens if you supplement people over really long periods of time or much longer periods of time, so chronic supplementation. So we've also uh, run some studies using, again, citrus drinks. So this is a commercially available uh, drink. This is a, a drink produced by PepsiCo called Tropicana. And what we did was we gave people either 500 milliliters daily of a flavonoid rich, of the flavonoid rich um, Tropicana drink or a placebo drink, which was matched for sugars and calories and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is a crossover design over a period of eight weeks. I won't go into the design here, but you can see it just there. And uh, so all participants did both arms of that intervention. And the key uh, uh, finding is really the global function finding on that left hand side graph. So what it shows is, again, over the course of eight weeks, the placebo group, a bit like the acute study actually, show a slight attenuation of performance over time, whereas in the flavonone-rich group on the right-hand side there, um, performance is maintained at eight weeks. So, uh, so flavonoids in this experiment seem to suggest a, a maintenance of cognitive performance over that eight-week period in, in a group of older adults. Now, we've also shown in another study that actually after 12 weeks of exactly the same flavanol uh, uh, rich drinks, uh, you also show an increase in BDNF levels in serum, uh, in blood serum in the periphery of, uh, of adults as well, uh, which again suggests a potential mechanism of action for how uh, those, uh, those cognitive effects might operate. Now, at the moment, we're also, uh, we've just finished a, a large study which tries to bring together all of these elements into one study. Very often in intervention studies like this, you will measure cognition, but not um, uh, measures in the brain, or you might measure physiological measures, but not cognitive measures. So in this study, we've tried to bring everything together into a single uh, complex intervention study. Um, the design is a, a, a placebo-controlled parallel arm trial, and so this is the key uh, uh, sort of design feature of this. So what we do is we supplement adults over a course of 24 weeks, uh, either in a high or low flavonoid uh, condition, and then we also visit, uh, invite them back for a third visit after a 12-week washout. And what this allows us to do is to look at um, whether cognition is maintained, but also whether there are any changes in uh, brain morphology and uh, things like cerebral uh, blood flow as well. Now, unfortunately, this um, the analysis of the study has been delayed somewhat by uh, the COVID pandemic. So all I can do today is present the main global composite score. So this data shows baseline 24 weeks and 36 weeks uh, in terms of overall cognitive performance. The blue line represents the high flavonoid uh, condition and the red line, the low flavonoid condition. And I think what this illustrates is that a follow up, you can see that same slight attenuation in cognitive performance in the flavonoid low group, as we've seen elsewhere, but a maintenance in cognitive performance at 36 weeks in the high flavonoid condition. Um, and what we'll do, obviously, as more data becomes available, is, is share that data through uh, a, a number of publications that we're planning. So in terms of summary, um, evidence of acute and chronic effects, um, these are all physiologically relevant intakes as well. So what we've been doing is using uh, the equivalent of one or two cups or portions per day in the intervention studies that I've reported here. And we're starting to, I think, elucidate evidence of mechanisms of action as well. Now, just as a, as a final couple of slides, I just want to mention something else that we're doing. So we're also taking a step back to some degree and looking at the totality of the health benefits of flavonoids. So the benefits of flavonoids, not just to uh, cognition, but also to uh, chronic conditions such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, and also arthritis. And what we're gonna do is an umbrella review, which takes account of all of the systematic reviews and meta-analysis that have looked at single disease endpoints so far. And what we're going to be doing is trying to identify health outcomes, flavonoid subclasses, or subpopulations with the strongest evidence of action and also interactions between uh, different conditions as well. 
So I won't go through all of the methods now, but what I wanted to sort of uh, finish by saying is that we are now midway through that umbrella review. So we've screened about 772 articles and we're now moving on to the data extraction and then analysis of that data. And we hope to publish the results of this study later on uh, this year. So for the future, we need larger studies that combine cognitive and brain measures. Uh, we also need to explore combinations of flavonoids. So flavonoids, different subclasses of flavonoids have different uh, uh, pharmacokinetic effects and they haven't really been explored yet. We also need to look at optimizing lifestyle interventions. So we need more multi-component interventions that combine exercise, nutrition and brain training. And there's also a lot more work to be done looking at gut brain interactions. They have some really interesting interactions uh, that might uh, might reveal individual differences in terms of the effects of flavonoids on cognition. Thank you. OK, and then the final presentation is by Damian Barney. Uh, from the University of Sydney, Australia. And the title of his talk is Trajectories of Sp Spirals as Cognitive Fle Flexibility During NBAC Training. So, the Damian, please. Hi, my name is Damian Burney. I'm from the University of Sydney, and I'm going to be talking about tra trajectories of spirals as cognitive flexibility during NBAC training. So, what is the NBAC task? Uh, most of you will be familiar with it. Uh, in the NBAC task, you presented a series of stimuli and uh, one after the other. And for each stimuli, you have to indicate whether it's the same as the one that was presented NBAC. So in this particular case here, we have a two-BAC task and you're asked to indicate whether the location of the blue square, the stimuli, um, is the same as the location that it was in uh, two-BAC. Uh, so this is referred to as a single NBAC task. There are also dual NBAC tasks. Um, and in dual NBAC tasks, what you need to do is while you're doing um, this matching uh, NBAC for the location of the blue square, you're hearing letters being presented through headphones and you have to indicate whether the letter that you hear uh, is the same as the letter that you heard in back. Uh, again, this is a two back task. So the NBAC task taps uh, executive functions. It's particularly, or uh, in particular, it's thought to tap updating and working memory. You can sort of see the nature of the task why that might be the case. Um, some of the well-accepted sources of cognitive load uh, in the NBAC task has been N levels. So if you have to keep in mind three back or four back, uh, it can, you can see how that could be quite, um, start to become quite challenging, particularly if you're doing a dual NBAC task where you're doing it for two streams of stimuli. A second source of um, uh, cognitive load in the NBAC task is what's referred to as the presence of a lure trial. So a lure trial here, as an example, is where the current stimulus is not a match to the one that's two back in this case, but is a match to the one that is, in this case, N plus one back, and also uh, N minus one back. So these trials here, these trials that are um, the same as the target trial here that we're uh, matching for, um, distract the user or, the, or the, the, the problem solver from making a correct decision to not um, match this, this stimulus here. So they're um, thought to be more difficult. And we actually see that um, Burgess uh, et al, Gray et al have shown that there is increased activation during lower trials and that that increased activation is associated with both fluid intelligence um, and uh, a working memory factor. Um, so it's a cognitive load that we can understand in terms of these functions. Um, what I'm interested in in this uh, set of studies that I'm going to be talking about is how uh, performance trajectories in this task across these different trials um, uh, can inform us about what's happening uh, with cognition, particularly in the context of the cognitive training uh, studies. So the first set of studies, what we wanted to do here is uh, to explore different performance metrics, the utility of different performance metrics for um, an adaptive version of the task, which is what we have here. So uh, they presented a dual end back um, and they could uh, do, um, based on their performance, um, they could go up to one, two, three, four, five end back. 
Their practice was over four days. Uh, they had 15 blocks of, of practice per day, um, and each block consisted of 20 trials. Okay, so the performance metrics we were interested in, a couple of these are relatively well established. Certainly the signal detection theories um, are well understood or well known performance metric. Uh, D prime as the relationship between hits and false alarms, um, this formula here, uh, as well as a, a performance metric, which is simply the proportion of hits minus false alarms. So they are our first two uh, performance metrics we're interested in. Uh, Kane et al. Uh, 2007 used uh, these metrics as um, uh, performance metrics of uh, the NBAC task uh, when they're exploring its relationship to working memory. Um, another performance metrics is the mean level that one has achieved, so the N level that one has achieved. So you can see how this might be useful in the cognitive training task. It's, it's the level of N that you've got to um, after after practice or that you get to as you're going through your practice. This is what Yagi et al. used in their 2008 study, looking at the uh, training on the NBAC task, dual NBAC task and its influence on fluid intelligence. The novel metric that I'm going to um, present here is based on IRT, um, in particular the many facets rash model. Um, I won't go into details about the underlying model, it's there, uh, but essentially we can extract out uh, parameter estimates from this model, uh, the ability of the person, typical IRT parameter, the difficulty of the item. Here we're, we're framing the trials as the item. And we can include additional facets here, like the presence of Lua trials or uh, NBAC level and see their impact on performance, which is what we did. So when we ran the uh, rash analyses uh, based on this facets model, we included here uh, three or four additional facets. So of course we had the person facets. Um, as I mentioned, trial uh, trajectories, this is the item facets, uh, and we can see two different item types or trial types, the audio trials versus the visual trials. This is the two streams of the NPAC. Uh, and we can see that um, scored here is the difficulty. So as uh, the items uh, go up, the trials increase, we're seeing an increase in difficulty and then it starts to flatten off and peak a little bit there. Uh, in terms of N level, we can see that as we go from what level, uh, one back, two back, three back, four back and five back, there's an increase in difficulty. In terms of lures, we can see when there is no lure, uh, it is easier than when there is a visual law versus an audio law versus uh, having both laws at once. Uh, so laws are more difficult than non-law trials. And uh, interestingly, from our trajectory point of view, we can see in terms of blocks, when there are 60 blocks being con conducted across the four days, uh, we can see that as blocks increase, uh, the uh, difficulty of the block is decreasing. Okay, which is suggesting that there's a performance increase. Um, this is the fit to the model, if it was appropriate based on these facets. So we extracted from um, our data these different metrics and we're interested in testing the extent to which they are able to tell us something interesting about the, um, the cognitive load in the task. The first was the classic end level. Uh, so the mean end level achieved over training. Uh, this is the trajectories of the, at the end level across blocks. Uh, we extracted the uh, hits to false alarms, signal detection theory, and you can see that this distribution is quite uh, skewed. There's a ceiling effect here. Um, and this is the average distribution across blocks. In terms of our D prime score, another metric from signal detection, detection theory, again, we see that there is a, um, a ceiling effect, okay? And this is the tra average trajectory across blocks here. Uh, and finally, our novel metric um, is the RASH scale score. We can see certainly relative to the, the, the other performance distributions or metrics of the uh, distributions of the other performance metrics, uh, that we're having something that's looking like there is some interesting variability and uh, this is the distribution. So while the distributions all look relatively similar um, in terms of when we average across uh, trials within blocks, 
the underlying distributions are quite different. So let's have a look at the impact of those. So uh, here what we've done is to model um, using a, a linear mixed effects regression um, block a measure of fluid intelligence, which is Raven's progressive matrices and the interaction between the two with each of our four different performance metrics. Uh, and this just to remind you of the underlying distributions of these, these four metrics. Uh, what we see is that for our IRT facet score, the NBAC facet score, uh, both significant block effects, a significant Ravens effect, Ravens predicts uh, performance, high levels of, of Ravens better performance, and a significant interaction. Uh, we also see uh, a similar, without the significant interaction, with our uh, mean level, okay, just the mean level of, of NBAC that, that you've achieved. Uh, the interaction was not significant. Uh, interestingly though, neither the D prime or the, the hits versus false alarms uh, was significantly predicted by Ravens uh, or the interaction term, okay, which is somewhat counterintuitive uh, given the cognitive nature of the NBAT task. So it suggests that the D prime and proportion of hits to false alarms as a measure of performance trajectories across blocks um, may not be optimal. Uh, having said that, block was a significant predictor in all of these measures. It just didn't relate so well to uh, our cognitive measure here. Okay, now the second study was to try to maybe the reasons that we see these trajectories the way that we do is because of the adaptive nature. So in this set of studies, again, a small sample of university students um, completed this similar sort of task, a dual buck task. Uh, but we're only going to consider the conditions in which uh, they practice just two back only, so it was not adaptive, or just three back only, so a little bit more difficult, but also not adaptive. I won't be talking about the third condition, which was an adaptive version here. Uh, what we see is that, again, we have um, a significant block effect. So across trials, uh, rather across blocks, uh, people are, are getting better. So performance is increasing here. This is proportion correct. Uh, and that, um, that, that getting better, if you like, uh, is greater for the two-back, the easier two-back condition than the more difficult three-back condition. Um, here we see a negative trajectory uh, with trials. So as trials increase, uh, we see that performance is decreasing. And this gives us some idea that there is a, um, an, uh, some distraction going on, and possibly this is due to the lure trials that we were talking about before. So the distraction is greater for three-back condition than it is for two-back condition. Okay, um, we see uh, significant differences um, as a function of block uh, and level here. The, um, the three-way interaction uh, was significant also. So the, the next set of things, uh, next set of um, slides that I'm going to present is going to try to explore. Um, these uh, negative trial effects. So what's happening to lead us to performing increasingly more, more poorly within a block across trials, but getting better across um, blocks. Okay, so if we looked at the average trajectories of the data that I just described, this is sort of what we see here. Uh, when we plotting these just with low S curves, nothing special here, uh, we can see that the decline by trials is quite steep earlier on. Um, and then there's um, somewhat uh, um, slower, slower decline. But we do see some um, uh, oscillation here. There's a little bit of ups and downs. The block effects is quite noisy, generally a positive increase. Uh, if we look even more closely at what's happening uh, here now within each individual block by trial trajectories, we can see there's quite a lot of evidence for some oscillation here, uh, this up and down. So people losing track of information, presumably held in memory, regaining their thoughts and then continuing. Um, so the purpose of our third study is to, uh, to um, look at this, these different trajectories in a little bit more detail. Um, the model that we're proposing here is a spiraling model. Okay, and so what we're saying here is that uh, people will, uh, some people will perform 
they will spiral, sort of lose track of their memory. They'll go along here in this red curve and they'll recapture, you know, they'll regain their attention. Others uh, are likely to move along, have a failure, spiral in other words, um, but never quite recover um, their attention again to continue performing. So we're interested in modeling um, this spiraling and recovery function. Uh, now, this is a simulation that we've, we're looking at uh, where we try to, to test this, the, the, the likelihood of this spiral. I'm not going to go into details here because I don't have a lot of time. But the goal uh, ultimately is to try to explain uh, these, these, this oscillation that we see in this data um, uh, in, in, more, um, in more detail than we've been able to previously, and then to try to link these, uh, the likelihood of these spirals uh, to some cognitive factors. Uh, and this was the goal of study three. Okay, so study three is actually an adaptive training program that we have here. It's a large training program. We have 830 um, participants in this study. Um, they're older, average age of 60, ranging from eight to 19. Uh, and we're interested in trying to understand, again, this modeling, whether this modeling can help us understand what's happening in the real world. Unfortunately, um, we're still in the process of building these, uh, this model here. So we don't have a lot of um, yet uh, data to report on the, the usefulness of this model. Um, but what we do see, even in this complex data, is a decline with trials, a decline with adaptation levels, and an increase in blocks and that these effects differ as a function of level, okay? Um, so uh, the, the trajectories are interesting to us because we feel that they can help us to understand the cognitive load, the unique aspects of the cognitive load, um, and the traditional metrics that we've used may not be well positioned for us to understand um, that. And so this more, um, uh, nuanced modeling is the focus of our uh, future research. Um, so to be continued, uh, thank you for your time. I'm a little bit over uh, and I uh, hope to be able to see you all um, soon. Thank you very much. Dear audience, how was our symposium? I hope that you can get a new and uh, excellent re result of, results of our researches. And I, I know that you will feel some a bright future in even in a super aging society. Hope that symposium is fruitful for all of us. So thank you very much for joining our symposium. Thank you and bye-bye.